I do feel that you're one of the forgotten men of British boxing, relatively in a way, in, in a way which is, which isn't fair. You know, when you look at the, your achievements, which I was just listing before you actually joined the broadcast, um, do you, do you feel that way sometimes? Is, is it something you feel that you you haven't gotten the, the credit you fully deserve? No, no, really. I'm, um, you know, uh, over the last couple of years, you know, I've been having a lot of interest in the boxing news. And did an article on me in last week's boxing news, which uh, which was a very good article. Um, whenever I go, I still get noticed. So no, you know. But you're still yeah. feeling the love. Yeah, of course. You know, my my fans are the best in the world, and you know, the ones who were there then, they they still there now. How did it all start for you, Robbie? The the amateur journey. Well, I started. Well, I started boxing. I'm. I was actually on holidays with my uncle Pat, who's a who was a professional trainer in the Die Gardena camp. And um, Pat was sadly taken taken from us. Um, he died, and his his wife died, and the the great grandson died in a in the house in Lock, to do him lots of poisoning, which was which was heartbreaking for the family. But he was on holidays. He was, and Die was on the holiday with us. Yeah. Um. So me and my brother, you know, we, we was talking boxing and going to the gym. Um, my, my me and my brother went to the gym when we come back, and my brother I think only went once or twice, and it wasn't for him. But as, as soon as I hit the bag, I just fell in love with it. And um, what? How old were you when you had your first amateur bout? About fifteen, I was. I started quite late. Okay. Um, and it was was it something was it one of those situations where it was being a smaller guy the lighter weight divisions you tend to have less depth of competition was it was it hard to get bouts did you have to go a long way hard to get fights you know um i was mainly just boxing in, in the championships really you know it was, it was hard to get fighters especially in wales and um, we, we'd have to get boys from you know england come to, and fight me on club shows where i'd go up to england and box you know who was your who were your boxing heroes when you were when you were in those early days as an amateur? Did, did you aspire to the smaller guys or did you have a hero who was one of the heavier kind of divisions? Mamadali, Mamadali has always been my hero and always will be. But you know, I, I um I love certain fighters you know, in the smaller weights. Julio Cesar Chavez, um, you know, Sochit Lada, another good flyweight. Um it was obviously the four kings, you know, Agla Duran, Leonard and Ernst was they were just amazing and you know, and you're inspired to be like them. And you're you're quite an historian. I was actually surprised to discover a little bit surprised, not surprised, but a funny perception of yourself. More that uh, it's quite rare to meet a, a professional fighter who is really well read up on the sport because you you actually had one over me. You said who was the first ever world Welsh champion, and I can't remember what my guess was, but I was wrong. And you said no, it was Percy Jones. So you, you are a bit yeah. of a student, aren't you? Uh, well, you know, I, I, yeah, I've studied it all my life, not so much today, but obviously um, other fighters are yesterday and my heroes have gone by. You know, I, lo I love reading about them and, and these stories and their lives. Well, did you always intend to turn pro? When you were coming up as a, as, a, as a teenage amateur, was it always the goal to turn pro or was that a decision you made a little bit later down the line? Absolutely. You know, I was in a professional gym. My style was professional and my style wasn't really made for the amateurs. Yeah, so my dream always to turn pro. You debut, I believe, at Splot Market in Cardiff, and you actually on your debut. Tell me about that, Robbie. Nineteen eighty nine. Um, yeah, it was my debut in Splot Market. Um, I boxed um a guy Eric George who I had some awful sad news. Um, just a couple of weeks ago, he had passed away. And yeah. you know, my my second daughter has got Eric's family. Do you think it was fair, or did you feel a little bit aggrieved on the night? Well, I won the fight. Um, Eric was was happy with the draw. I mean, no, if you're only happy with the draw if you if you've lost, that's the way I see it. Your second fight, in actual fact, after after the disappointment of that draw debut, Robbie was against future, you know, British title rival Francis Ampofo at the York Hall in Bethnal Green, and uh, and you beat him over six rounds on that occasion. <laughs> A sort of combination from Regan, but really just a little flurry compared to the incessant onslaught of Ampofo. There's the bell, that's it. Oh, would you believe it? Well, we knew it was close, Jim. I suspect neither of us realised quite how close it was. 
Yeah, um, it was a it was a close fight, you know. I but I well won the fight. We had the decision. I had the decision in London, you know. Um, I made a big mistake for there. It was my brother's wedding on a Saturday, and I drank a bit more than I should have. And I said that's the last time I go in the ring unless I'm hundred percent. Oh, what you had a drink? You had a drink on on the kind of whole whole kind of wedding celebration. No, I learned an odd lesson. That's a, a an odd lesson to learn. So Fred Scampofo ended up becoming more of a significant rival of yours. Uh, a mm -hmm. couple of years later, when in 1991, you, you won, initially, you won the British title of Joe Kelly. Let's talk about that first. Yeah, um, Joe Kelly, you know, he was a, he was, he was a favourite, um, a good fighter from Scotland, you know, um, he's a lot more experienced than I was. And I think that's why they made me the underdog, but I, 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 I thought, I, I know, I, I, um, I, I boxed out my skin all night and, you know, and, and won the title comfortably. It's all Reagan so far. Kelly has got to knock Reagan out to win this fight. And for Kidd who's only having his eighth professional fight, Reagan has been a revelation tonight. And your first defence, um, initially you lost it in the first defence to former rival Francis Ampofo by a stoppage, but I believe that was that was down to cuts as, as more than yeah, that. Um, I know, um, I was way up on the scorecards, it was 11th round, and um, you know, Francis butted me about four or five times. I mean, the cut needed 54 stitches. I mean, but it was it was that late in the fight. I, I think the, re the referee should have let it go on. I mean, the, the cut couldn't go any worse. There was only a round left. You know, it, it wasn't bleeding. It was it was that it was that deep and wide. It, it just wasn't bleeding. So I was having no trouble with my vision. So I, I felt that with Ivan, you know, robbed me of my title. He's telling his corner he can't see. Showing signs of distress, he can't do that with his opponent either. That's all he needs, and Pope is going to run in there and try and take it from him. Reagan looks tired. Reagan, he's, warning the referee Reagan, about Reagan, he's complaining that Ampovo is using yeah, his head. Yeah, that's what he's saying. Good right hand from Reagan. Oh no, oh. looks bad. And in the 11th round, head. he's stopping it. You put it right immediately in a rematch. Over 12 rounds, right? Yeah, um, you know, the fight happened just a few months after. I think uh, Francis and and they were open at the, the cut would probably open back up, but Raymond Sell, the doctor, he gave me more stitches than I, and was probably needed. He's a good friend of mine and he done such a such a great job on, on the cut. You know, I never had problems with it again. The crowd on their feet. Cross is still battling away at close forward, but Regan now coming back with shots. There's a round of Sargo. He wasn't really bothering to do that. Uh, it's going to be an eruption at the end of this fight if Regan gets it. Last 15 seconds now. 10 out of 10 to both of them. A great scrap. Good left hook out of Moby Regan there on the goal. Regan has got it. Your next peak of achievement came, I believe it was in um, around 1992. You won the European title against one Salvatore Farney. Yeah, you know, he's a tough fighter. He had a lot of knockouts on his record. Um, it's the first time he boxed out, outside Italy, you know, defending his title. Um, it took a lot of money to get him here. But, you know, it paid off, you know, it was a, it was a great fight. I won, I well won the fight, you know, have this decision. But it was, you know, the crowd got the money's worth, worth our night value for money, for sure. You've actually had experience of boxing in Italy yourself, didn't you, in your earlier career? You you drew with a fellow whose name I, I can't quite pronounce. But, and then you've been... Podigy. Go on, tell me. Michel Podigy. That's it. You got a draw with him on his in his backyard, I believe, in, in your early career. And, I, and I, I'm sure that it probably wasn't entirely a fair, a fair reflection, no. right? I actually, um, I dropped him in, a, I think it was the first or second round. He actually wanted to give up and he walked back to his corner and, and the promoter of the show pushed him back out. He wanted, he wanted to give up. And, um, you know, even, even after the fight, the referee in broken English, the referee apologised to me. He said he wasn't a judge. So, you know, even the referee admitted I won the, I won the fight.
people are right about 10 years later because it was about 10 years later he come back over here and box me again. And I beat him easier in Italy and I did over here, but I well won the fight over here. Okay. And then I know there was a defence of the EBU title against Danny Porter. Was, um, yeah. Then looking at your um, career between the defence against Danny Porter and the unsuccessful WBO flyweight title challenge to Alberto Jimenez, it looked like there was a few kind of stopgap fights marking time. Were you... Was there, any, was there a degree of frustration at that point in your career, Robbie, when you were trying to um, forward? I fought a fight, you know, they thought that was, that was going to be a tough fight. You know, Danny was highly regarded, um, and I blew him away in, in three rounds. And I signed a fight about three or four different champions, and after that fight, you know, none of them fights materialised for one reason or another. So I, I was left out in the cold, really, from, from one of my best performances worked against yeah. me. Oh, double left hook, missed with the body shot, hit with the head shot, another right hand, oh, Robo Porter's oh, on oh, his feet here, he's on his feet, oh, oh yes, he's on the floor. In big What a throw that for an attack. Doctor's up on the ring apron, count is seven. Let's see how it happens. Close look, giving him a look, giving him a chance. Reagan can finish this. This is a real on his feet. Wow, is this a surprise. Porter gritting his teeth. Oh, yes, that's, that's it. He's out again. It's, it's all, all over. Stop this it's all over. So, um, and then the next opportunity that came was the WBO flyweight title challenge against yeah. Jimenez in Cardiff, uh, which was stopped, I believe it was stopped in the ninth round. Can you tell me the circumstances? You know, I, you know, no, I don't make any excuses. The best man won on the night. But, you know, I, um, I had a very badly damaged on, you know, training for that fight. I couldn't spar. And I had to pull out the fight, and because I had to make him an ass wait, he wanted some more money to wait. So they, they took that out of my purse to give him out the, the money he wanted to wait. So I, I agreed to that. And then it was coming up to the fight again, and he put, he pulled out. So I yeah. said, well, if he's pull, pulling out now, I won't watch what originally agreed. And it's, it, my man told me it was all, you know, that's what I'd be having, what was originally agreed. And come day of the fight, I realised that that, that wasn't right. They, they were still taking that money out of my purse. So as well as, you know, the, the injury, I, I, I carried into that fight. My, my head wasn't right because, you know, how I was treated outside the ring. It's the first time in my life I didn't want to be in the ring. It's not a preparation you want for a world title fight. I mean, there's a great fighter, best man won, but he didn't box Robbie Began. That night he boxed, he boxed his shadow. I think it's something people sometimes don't realise. The stuff that goes on behind the scenes can really demoralise a fighter to the point where he's really able to give his best come to no time. True? Yeah, that's exactly what I felt going into the fight. I felt demoralised, you know. It was, it was awful. Do you know, Jimmy Benton told me when he fought Roberto Duran on the prior Aguayo card in 1982, he said he yeah. got to the point with all the politics and all the messing around and the fact that they lost the advertising because it wasn't going to be on TV when it was supposed to be on the TV slot. He said, literally, as he was waiting to fight Roberto Duran in the opening, in the introductions, he said he got to the point when he couldn't care if he won or lost. He was feeling so pissed Hello. off the stuff going on behind the scenes. Yeah, you know, that's not, that's, not, that's, not, that's, not, that's not what you need before a fight. You know, you want to be 100%, not just physically, you've got to be 100% mentally ready for that fight. Is the amateurs more fun and more of a pure kind of pastime, Robbie? Um, no, I enjoy my, my time, you know, fighting for ways and the great friends I made, you no know, friends for life I made, and had some amazing trips. But, you know, it, nothing can be as to be in a pro game where you're on your own. So, you know. So, the crowning glory of your career in the pro game did come in 1996 against... Um, Coincidentally, also a fellow called Jimenez, Daniel Jimenez, for the WBO Bantamweight title. We decided to go, to go up two divisions to Bantamweight. Had you been struggling to make flyweight previously, or was it a pure case of the opportunity at Bantamweight? Uh, to be honest, I should have gone up to, up to Bantamweight two years before I did. You know, in the end, it was killing me to make flyweight, absolutely destroying yeah. him. But because uh, they changed the weigh-ins then to the night to the day before, you know, I had a bit of extra time you know, to recover from making the weight. Do you believe in 
what do you think is better? The same day weigh-ins, or do you think that the previous day weigh-ins are better for boxers and for boxing? Honestly, with you, I think a weigh-in should be on the day of the fight. Um, yeah. I think it's encouraging some fighters who cannot make make these weights, but they kill themselves getting down to it because they think they got 24 hours to recover. But, you know, I, I, I think it's, uh, it, I don't think it works, you know. But I think uh, the safety of boxers, for them to make make and weights that they can't really make, you know, it's gonna it's more dangerous. I think so. Yeah, I mean, the trouble with it, Robbie, is it was instituted. It was instituted as a safety measure because yeah. people are killing themselves to make weight. But when you try to make things safer and fairer, you end up opening another loophole at the other side of the equation where people try to exploit it and they think, you know what, I'm going to make this weight that I can't safely make because I have got the time to replenish, and then I can fight naturally smaller men. It's it, 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 it's damned if you do and damned if you don't, I feel, to a great extent. That's right, you know, it's, it's down to the individual, you know. they got to, um, you know, each fight a, a different, so, you know, they, got, they they know what weight they can make and, and be comfortable at there, and that's what they should be fighting at. So tell me about your moment of crowning glory when it all came right on the night. Um, over to you, just to take me through it. Well, I was a no big, massive underdog again. I mean, he, he came to Britain and beat three very good fighters. I mean, he beat Duke McKenzie, took a super bantamweight weight title off Duke McKenzie. Yeah. Beat a very good fighter in Drew Doherty, a Scotsman. And he won the bantamweight weight title um, off Alfred Corti, who was an exceptional talent. You know, I, I done an exhibition with Alfred, so I knew how good he was. Um, and, and sadly, Alfred has now passed away, so, you know, may he rest in peace. Um, but, you know, I was a big underdog, but from, I think, you know, I won the fight unanimous decision. I mean, I, I dropped him in the eighth round. I mean, he, he lost his one away to, to the great Marco Antonio Pereira, and Pereira couldn't, didn't manage to drop him. Yeah. But, you know, for me to put him down in the eighth round, and it was a long count, it was a 14-second count. You oh. know, it's a, it's a big feather in my cap. And then to go on and win the Lamnus decision was, was my, all my dreams come true. Michael Fisher scores 116 to 111, all three in favour of the winner and new. Oh, he's got it! Robbie Regan! Delirious celebrations. Robbie Regan is the WBO bantamweight champion, the first Welshman ever to be a world champion at this weight. People will wonder. You, you're the WBO bantamweight champion of the world, and then the next thing you know, uh, you've you've retired. People will inevitably want to know why, uh, when you were at the top of your game. I feel the brain scan. You know, it was down to they, what they found uh, was um, some scar tissue on my brain, which was prob probably which was there a year before, which never bothered. You know, never never wasn't an hindrance to me. Um, it wasn't just a brain scan. I mean, I what happened after I won the title? I caught glandular fever, and that put me, you know, that, that virus, you know, is is such a horrific thing to go through. I mean, um, I had the same virus as John Lumo had, the rugby player, and it finished his career. So what really finished me was glandular fever. How how difficult was it for you to accept that the fact that your career was over at the top? And you're going to have to find something else to do with the rest of your days. At the time, you know, it was just so destroying. It destroyed me as a person, you know. Um, I think, you know, I, I started self-medicating with alcohol. You know, just, you're drinking just to forget. And, you know, an alcohol becomes an addiction. So, you know, you're, you're in a dark place. I know all about that. I didn't even win a world title and I managed to nearly destroy myself with the booze. So, I do, I do understand and sympathise about that. And how long did it take for you to, to um, you think, to get in a place where you, you'd accepted it and you were uh, going in another life direction? Well, it took me a few years, you know. Um, it took me a long time to get over it. Uh, boxing was my life, you know. My day was filled up, you know, routine. And when all that was taken away, you know, it's, it's very hard to come to terms with. But, you know, my life has gone on, you know. Um, i got two young boys now. So they, they, 
they fill they fill our gap the boy that was in my life which is which is fantastic do you feel there's not enough aftercare for fighters absolutely but now there's um there's ringside wrestling care who I'm, I'm an ambassador for um doing great things for fighters who fall on our times or been injured they trying to get they trying to um get something built um where they can house these the fighters who, who need help um like i say ringside wrestling care um they do and they're doing so many different things to raise money to get this this building built uh i'm go, actually going to america now with um in october with a lot of different champions michael watson is on the trip steve collins yeah. um is michael watson john conte has come in um and other champions we go we go on a tour america or in florida and there's going to be a couple of events where we'll be raising money for inside rest and care and for children's cancer so i'm looking forward to that which i got which i find very sad is none of the big time promoters have helped ringside rest and care yet you know they these fighters have um have, have helped them promoters you know get, get very very anti bank accounts so i think these promoters the big promoters should get involved and give a little bit bit back to the sport they love do you still follow the game today probably yeah the big fights you know um if there's a big fight on you know i i always watch a big fight like any big fight it don't matter about the weight uh, i'll watch you know and obviously and if it's my weight or my the, my old title you know it's a bonus it's a bonus to watch it there have you ever had any temptation or to, to pass on your skills and, and, and to get involved in coaching or well I did start a gym. Me and my friend Julian, we started a gym, um, and we had a boy helping us out. Jamie was helping me train the boys, um, but unfortunately, we 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 had the gym. They 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 sold the building, so the gym had to close. So maybe if we find another place, I'll, I'll get back into it. The anniversary of your world title win, the twenty fifth anniversary, comes up this April, right? Um, it would be nice to do something to commemorate it two big events happen actually there's going to be one in rome by the coliseum which is very fitting you know that's where the gladiators yeah. come from yeah. and you know all boxes of gladiators so it's very fitting to have a, a night a night being put on there by my great friend russ morgan who, who've helped me so much since i retired and he's been there for me so it's going to be one in rome and it's going to be one in cardiff where the people or my fans who can't make it to rome would be to come to Cardiff and celebrate, also celebrate with me there, my the 25th anniversary. Well, I'd very much like to come along myself if we're not all locked up in tier five, six, seven, or whatever. It's going to be after, obviously after the lockdown and when things sort of go back to normal. So you'll definitely have an invite, Ben. Thank you. Well, listen, champ, uh, it's great to talk to you again after all this time. I'd like to say, you know, always an outstanding to my fans, you know, they made my fight nights electric. Um, if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be to get champions out of the country to come and defend me, to def defend against me in Wales. So I owe it all to them, and you know, a piece of every title I won belongs to each and every one of them. Okay, champ. Thanks very much for your time today, and I'll speak to you ben, soon. Be lucky. Let's talk, my friend. You take care. Okay, champ. Thank all you. Best. All the best. <laughs>